morning and welcome to Valley View. It's so good to see all of you here um, braving the rainstorm. It's good to have rain, isn't it? I wanted to share with you these beautiful roses that we have today. Uh, those were given to us by Damien Vanessa Lucio in um, praise and thanks for their son Giovanni's 13th birthday. So we're glad to have the roses here in our church. Lynette, you've got a short announcement for us? Just real quick, I think y'all can hear me. Um, tomorrow the Pathfinders are having a car wash. I know it's raining today, but it's not supposed to rain tomorrow. And um, our director, Kyle Smith, wants the Pathfinders to really be active in community service this year. We're going to be doing lots for our community. And this car wash is not a fundraiser for our church. It's a fundraiser for all the fire victims. We're going to be donating our money to help our community. And um, so if you want to have your car washed, whether it needs it or not, <laughs> come on to Cartwright. We'll be on the far side. Um, where the you'll see us, we're going to have our bootstrap. I don't remember with our shoe dry. We have the big boots. The Brian, maybe, he's going to be out waving at everybody and waving them in. So just pray for a good day and that we can um, get a lot of funds for our community. And um, and to remind you guys that next Sunday, the 18th, is our 50s car hop social, veggie burgers and hot dog dinner, um, and activities. And you can come to the far back parking lot beginning at 4:30. We will have menus for you, and we will have a fun time together as a church social. So I hope you all come at 4.30 next Sunday as well. Oh, it sounds like the 18th is going to be a very busy day. I have a couple of announcements that the pastor sent to me that um, he wants everyone to know about. Ron Mitchell is the head elder down at the Ashland Church. And um, they are redoing the roof on the community center. It's a flat roof, and he could really use the help of three guys with strong backs. If he gets the help he needs, they should be done in about five hours. So they are looking at uh, 9 o'clock next Sunday, the 18th. So there's a job for you. And then, but wait, there's more. We need to have a church business meeting. It's that time of the year when we're looking at our uh, finances, the, um, the church budget, and our financial committee has met. They have a budget that they are going to present to um, the church board, and then it will come to the the uh, members as a church body. So we're going to have that on the 18th also. Um, 18th is what I have here. Do I hear 25? <laughs> Okay, um, yeah, that's right, it, uh, well see we would have it announced today and next Sabbath and then the next day it would be the meeting, but now the, our two treasurers are saying it'll be the following Sabbath, or Sunday, sorry, but please put that in your mental calendars. Um, we do need to have as many people at that meeting to approve it as we can. It, it's not to be approved just by the church board. It's the members as a whole. Um, we have children today in our church. We're so glad to see the Espana family here visiting with us today. So Kevin, you have a children's story? Children, would you like to come up and sit on the front pew? And Kevin will have a story for you.
social distance. <laughs> it is so, I mean, it's good to see you guys too, but I've seen you already. It is so good to actually have kids back in our church. So does anybody know what this is? This is not you. What, this, what is it? It's a peeler. I'm glad she said that because a lot of people look at this and they call it a potato peeler, which it peels potatoes, but it's a peeler. You know, if you use this peeler right, it can do a lot of good, right? It really helps peeling potatoes, getting the skin or carrots or fruits, whatever you want to peel. This thing works really good. But you know, if you're not really careful with it, it's really sharp. And it can do a lot of damage. So I have to tell you that this children's story, I actually, I'm borrowing it. I didn't steal it. I'm borrowing it. I heard it this morning from the Anderson Church. And the man that was telling it said he was peeling and he forgot to pay attention because everything that was going on. And he hooked his fingernail and he took his fingernail clear off. Oh. So you have to be really careful with them, don't you? But as long as you do what it's supposed to do with it, it works really well. And so I'm going to be very careful when I put it back in my pocket. So the same is true with a lot of things. If we use our legs, they can do a lot of good for us, can't they? But can legs do bad things too? I'm sure you have never kicked your sister. <laughs> oh, maybe. How about your arms? Are your arms good? They can do really good stuff, can't they? But can arms do bad things too? They can. What about your tongue? You ever think about that? Does your tongue do good things? What are some of the things that your tongue can do? It helps you talk. It, oh, I like this girl. It tastes ice cream and other good foods as well. Can your tongue do bad things? Well, it just so happens that the Bible talks about the tongue. And in Psalms 34... 12 and 13, it says, whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, everybody love life and, and want to see a lot of really good days, then keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. And Proverbs 12, 18 says, the words, that's what comes out, right? She says, talk, the words of the reckless pierce like a sword but the tongue of the wise bring healing. And so I want you to think about that today, that everything we do can be done either for good or for bad. So we want to make sure that when we talk to people, that we use our legs and our arms and our mind the way God intended us to, okay? You can go back to your seats now. Our offering this morning is for the world budget, and a portion of that offering is going to go to the Voice of Prophecy and La Voz de la Esperanza. The Voice of Prophecy exists to proclaim the everlasting gospel of Christ, leading people to accept Jesus as their personal Savior and nurturing them in preparation for his soon return. A leader in religious broadcasting, the Voice of Prophecy focuses on God's love and heralds the soon return of Christ, providing hope to broken people and guidance for daily living. Founded in 1929 by HMS Richards, the ministry continues today 
under the leadership of speaker director Sean Boonstra and associate speaker Jean Boonstra. In 1942, La Voz de la Esperanza began broadcasting to bring the gospel to the Spanish-speaking world. The Voice of Prophecy can be heard in nearly three dozen languages, and Bible lessons are available in 70 languages. Local Discover Bible schools have been established in more than 2,000 churches across North America, and that is something that we have right here in Valley View, the Discover Lessons. If you belong to a small group, hopefully you are getting this at your group um, during the week after we are meeting on Sabbath. La Voz de la Esperanza also has a Bible school with four collections of lessons. As the Voice of Prophecy and La Voz de la Esperanza look to the future, they will continue to focus on sharing the love of Christ with a hurting world. Let's support this Christ-centered ministry with our resources on this World Budget Sabbath. And I, I know that we cannot take up an offering here in the sanctuary, but please remember that um, in the foyer there is a basket where you can place your offerings as you leave the church service. But let's do have a prayer of blessing for that offering. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity that you give to us to give back to these different ministries um, as they are spreading the, the gospel around the world. We ask that our offerings will be blessed, that um, the um, ministries will do what they are intended, for we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Barbara, would you share our, your special music, please? been a long time since I've been up here I think <laughs> maybe 10 months um, I picked a uh, oh thank you Charlie for getting pictures um, I picked the song steal away to play which is a spiritual I'm going to say tell you a little bit about spirituals I picked it because of its beautiful simple melody and message and because I love spirituals and their rich musical heritage they functioned as an integral part of labor, rest, worship, and communication, and as a means of sharing daily burdens of life, thereby bringing encouragement and hope. Composed during an extended season of great suffering and pain, they convey clear messages of profound religious impact. These are words from uh, the arranger of this um, spiritual, Calvin Taylor, who is a um, renowned Adventist um, musician. He was actually a friend and classmate of our own Chuck Lloyd. So Chuck has told me that he used to play with him in the academy. Um, I think that these enslaved people had little free time, as verified by Frederick Douglass's autobiography, which I recently read. They were sleep deprived most of the time. They had to work such long hours and then take care of their own needs. So they had to steal away time during their work and chores to spend time with their Lord. How much time are we stealing away with Jesus?
you, Barbara. I really enjoyed that. Our scripture this morning, Isaiah 14, 12 to 14. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation, on the farthest sides from the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, on this Sabbath morning, we give you praise and thanks that we are able to be here together to worship in your house. We ask that you would be with each one today as we hear the message that we will be blessed by it. We also pray for those who are not with us that um, need to be perhaps in their homes. We ask that you will bless them. We ask for um, a healing upon each one in their own ways. There are many that need spiritual healing, many that need physical healing. Father, we pray for those people who were brought up during our praise and prayers this morning. Again, you know who those are, and we ask that you will touch each one's need in their own ways. We ask, Father, that um, you will be with Kevin as he brings us the word this morning, that you will touch his lips and present this in a way as we need to hear it. And I ask for a very special blessing on us today. In Jesus' name, amen. is wonderful when it works the way it is supposed to. I may need your help, Charlie. So the anatomy of evil. Yeah. Today our subject is the anatomy of evil. And we're going to examine one of the toughest questions probably that has ever been asked of the Christian religion, or for that matter, any other non-monotheistic religion. If God is good and God is love, then where do things like pain and suffering actually come from? The answer is not our theory or our ideas. In fact, the answer can only be found one place, and that's in the Word of God. So why do we have suffering in this world? And it kind of runs like this. If God is good, the way the Bible says, and if God is all-powerful, the way that the Bible says, and God is also love, then why? Why does God allow it? And of course, what the critics are suggesting is that maybe God isn't good after all, or that maybe God really just doesn't exist at all. So let's look at the big picture. And I want to start with an amazing prophecy found in the Revelation chapter 12. And what we're about to read usually comes as a surprise to a lot of people. And there was war in heaven. Where was the war? It was in heaven. That's right. The Bible teaches us that pain and suffering didn't actually start on this planet. The first war was fought in the kingdom of heaven. That means that God actually knows something about pain and suffering. It's not as if God 
is living in a remote corner of the universe completely protected from pain and suffering. In fact, God is experiencing suffering. He is living through it. According to the Bible, the problem actually started in God's own home. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Let's try that again. And prevailed not. Thank you. I think that sometimes that we, we miss that point, that yes, there was war in heaven, but Satan did not prevail. Neither was there found a place anymore in heaven. There's a war in heaven, and by the end of the story, someone called the dragon gets kicked out. So, who exactly is the dragon? Is it the devil? And how do we know that? You know it by reading the whole story. And in this case, you don't even have to read very far. So the dragon was cast out, the serpent of, de- of old, called the devil and Satan. There we go. Who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. There is no question about it. The Bible is very clear that the dragon is represented of Satan. That ought to serve as a warning to the human race. Not all angels are good. According to the Bible, some of them are fallen, and they make it their business to deceive the whole world. That should make us stop, take inventory. So, have you ever met a person that said, you know, that they've had a, an angel experience? And I am not saying that that every angel experience is bad. Contrary, I just believe that we need to take a look at those experiences. If someone says that they saw an angel or they heard from an angel, it might be true. It might be a heavenly angel. But there again, it might not be. So even if the angel appears in your home and tells you something, you still need to check it against the Bible because that's what we're supposed to do. And don't worry, I'm betting that if a heavenly angel comes to your doorstep and talks to you, that if you say, can you hang on just a moment, I want to check it with the Bible, he would say, amen, praise the Lord, let me help you. Contrary to the other side of that. An evil angel comes to you and you say, just a minute, can I check it with my Bible? He is not going to be real happy, in fact, he'd probably just leave, which is even a better thing. But this is a very important concept According to the book of Revelation, some angels have been cast out and they make it their business to deceive. Just because something looks good and sounds good and seems miraculous, that still does not mean that it is coming from God. I can't emphasize that enough, especially when the Bible is so clear that deception is a key feature in the last days. The only safe place to stand is in the word of God. In fact, Paul even tells us in 2 Corinthians 11, 14, that Satan knows how to masquerade as an angel of light. And ever since he was kicked out of heaven, he has been employed full time trying to do exactly that, keeping people from seeing the truth about God. The big question then is why? Why did God kick these angels out? Was it because he suddenly found them boring? Was it because he was trying to renovate the place and these old angels just didn't look right? Of course not. Ezekiel 28 tells us what happened. Listen to this carefully. God is speaking directly to Lucifer. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper sapphire and turquoise and emerald with gold. The workmanship of timbrels and pipes were prepared for you on the day you were created till iniquity was found in you, in Satan. Now there's a really important that the Bible says that God found. Did you catch that? God found iniquity in Lucifer. He did not create it He did not, okay? He did not put it there. 
The Bible says that he found it. And there is a big difference between God creating evil and God finding evil. In the very beginning, God's creation was perfect. It was good, and it was sinless. It was perfect peace and happiness, and God was not the author of pain and suffering. It wasn't his creation. But still, somehow Lucifer managed to sin, and you've got to wonder, how is that even possible? You would think it couldn't happen, but it did. And the reason it happened is because God created living beings with the freedom to choose. You and I were born with the ability to turn our back on God. So then you've got to ask, why would God even do that? It doesn't make sense until you really think about it. Follow me carefully. The Bible teaches in 1 John 4, 8 that God is love. But if you don't have a choice, then you can't have love because love is is voluntary. And for the men out there, I want you to think about this for a moment. So you take a long trip and you come home and your wife is still there. Is that not a good thing? Does it not mean that she still loves you and that she wants to be around you? And what about you wives? So your wife, you leave, you leave and you're gone. And when you come home, your husband is there and it's satisfying, right? Because you know that he loves you. And again, he wants to be there with you. But what if the only reason your spouse was still at home at the end of the day is because you had chained them to the wall? How satisfying would that be? You would know that they would run away as soon as you freed them. You see, real love involves a choice. God created you and me with the ability to choose, and yes, it was risky. So why would he take the risk? It's really not that hard to figure out. I love this picture. Isn't that cute? Ask a child if they'd rather have a wind-up battery-operated puppy or the real thing. You know, good and well, he's going to take the real thing. Even though a real puppy comes with risks, it's going to chew on the furniture or your shoes or your slippers they bark in the middle of the night and occasionally they leave surprise packages in the middle of your living room floor. A real puppy can be very risky. But still, it's what the child wants. Why? Because it can love you back. Kids really want a puppy because a real puppy can give you a real relationship. It's the same way with a baby. Every time you bring another child into the world, you are taking a huge risk. The baby is going to make mistakes. I promise you that. Sorry, Andrew. That baby is going to make a mess in its diaper, and you have to clean it. It's going to write on the wall with crayons. I did. It's going to leave home someday and it's going to start a life of its own. You know what are risks? But you still really want a baby. You don't want a robot. Why? Because a real baby means a real relationship. It gives you the possibility of real love. And a God of love is a God of relationships. So he created us with the freedom to choose. He wants a real two-way relationship with us. He wants real love. So it's a risk that he was willing to take, and one day, one of the angels suddenly walked away. Here's how the Bible tells that story. How you are fallen, O heaven, from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. What was the prominent word that came out in that? I. 
It's obviously that Lucifer's focus was on himself. At some point, he quit trusting in God and he turned his attention on himself. He stopped loving God and he fell in love with himself. You know, the Bible describes him as very beautiful. I know that we like to think of the devil as this little red guy running around with horns and a pitchfork, but the Bible says that he was magnificent. But then he fell in love with himself, and there is nothing quite as ugly as pride. I don't care how beautiful you are, if your heart is full of pride, that's anything but attractive. The Bible says that Lucifer deceived a pro, excuse me. The Bible says that Lucifer developed a problem with pride. And he used his God-given power of choice to turn against God and to start building his own empire. He began to sow doubt about God with the other angels. Little whispers here and little comments there. And he raised question about the character of God. Maybe God doesn't really know what he's doing. Maybe this whole system is just a little bit unfair. I mean, all of these rules that God has. And it is true. There are rules. God has rules. The Ark of the Covenant was a symbol of God's throne in heaven. And inside the Ark was a copy of what? The Ten Commandments. God's code of moral conduct. The government of God is a moral government. His throne is based on moral principles. So yes, God has rules. And why does God have rules? Well, doesn't everybody need rules? Why do you think we have a bright yellow line that runs down in a freeway? Why do you think that we're told to drive on the right side of the road. It's because we need clear boundaries. And in order to understand, in order to live together peacefully, we have to have boundaries. Try driving in a place that doesn't have any rules. And you quickly discover that you're taking your life in your hands. And I see Russ and Daisy going, oh man, because you've been to Mexico a time or two and probably have driven there and, and it is risky. My stepdad goes down there and he was talking to a friend of his and he said, yeah, he said, watch this. And he had this little video clip and it was a police officer sitting there. And the police officer took off and there's a stop sign, right? Police officer, no lights, just drove right through it. And everybody else did too. Yes, they looked, but they paid no attention to the signs that were there. There are rules to keep us safe. You show them where the boundaries are. You put up a guardrail and then you say, if you do this, if you cross this line, then there will be consequences, there will be pain, and there will be suffering because of it. That's what a God of love does. And the Bible says that Lucifer chose to disregard everything and to strike out as his own. So let's keep reading in Revelation 12. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads, ten horns, seven diadems on his head. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And God suddenly lost one third of his family. Try to imagine the pain if you've ever lost a family member. And I want you to understand that God understands how we feel. He has lost millions of them. And of course, the question is, why didn't God just do something about it? Why did he not just eliminate the fallen angels, stamp them out before they could ever spread religion? Think about that really carefully. Sometimes the only way people will learn to not touch the hot stove, we talked about this in Sabbath school, is to actually let them touch it. Unfortunately, some of us are bullheaded enough that we have to touch that hot stove before we realize that it will hurt. So God also allowed the universe to touch the hot stove. He warned us, but we didn't listen. 
So now, because he is a God of freedom, he's letting us experience just enough that we will never do it again. Just think about what happened, would have happened if God would have wiped out Lucifer at the moment he sinned. The other angels might have been listening to his lies. So how are they going to respond? What are they going to think if Lucifer suddenly disappeared? Maybe Lucifer had a point. After all, it's kind of like God was scared of what he was saying. So if you had a brother or a sister, and they started speaking badly about dad, then one day they were all of a sudden gone, what would you think? You're going to think, hmm, maybe they were right. Maybe they had a point. God is obviously smarter than we are, so he didn't just kill Lucifer. Instead, he was giving the fallen angels just enough leash to prove to the whole universe that they don't know what they are doing. He's given them the freedom to try running things their way. And in the end, the whole universe will see that the path of rebellion is the path of pain and suffering and death. And when it is all finished, when history draws to a close, and I believe that it is coming very close to that now, that there is no way that God's people will ever rebel again. And that was the beginning of the great conflict, a controversy that's been raging for a long time. The war began in heaven and the fallen angels were removed. They weren't allowed to stay because sin cannot dwell in the presence of a holy God. So they came here to this planet and they looked at us, the apple of God's eye, and they get a thought. These people, they are made in the image of God. If we can get them to walk away, if we can get them to join our rebellion, imagine how embarrassing that would be for the government of God. We're going to prove that nobody would actually choose God if they were given a reasonable alternative. So the Bible talks about an incident in the Garden of Eden where, God's, where God had set up the human race with perfect happiness. It was free to enjoy the garden, free to do as they pleased. There was just one little rule. And the Lord commanded man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. I want you to think about this carefully, because at first glance it doesn't make a lot of sense. First of all, God says, you can eat of every tree in the garden except that one. Why that one? Is it poisonous? No. Then why not? There was only one real reason. If you're going to choose God freely, you have to have an alternative. So God gives them one. This is all about a relationship. It's all about loyalty to God. It's about choosing God or not choosing Him. Adam and Eve had to make a choice, and their loyalty didn't really mean much. They had to have a choice, or the devil could have accused God of holding them hostage. You're not even showing them that there is an alternative. Of course these people are going to obey you, you haven't given them a choice. So the devil takes on the form of a serpent and he approaches Eve with a proposition. And a woman said, and he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall eat of every tree of the garden? Pay really close attention to what the devil is doing because he, it's, it's a real eye-opener. He didn't directly contradict God. He just questioned God's integrity. He raised a question about God. He cast doubt on God's word. Did God really say that? You know, he's doing the same thing today. He never really challenges God outright. He just raises question about God's word. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of every tree of the garden, 
but of the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. What's going on? What's happening? What is really going to happen if Eve eats that fruit? She's going to die. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. The serpent said to the woman, you'll not surely die. Do you see it again? It's not an outright contradiction. He's just saying, it's not true. You'll never die because it's a lot more subtle than that. You're not really going to die. He's just raising the question, really? You're really going to die? Is that really how it's going to work? Is there something that God isn't telling you? So when the woman saw that the fruit was good for food and it was pleasant to the eye and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate it. She also gave it to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Listen, Eve, maybe God isn't giving you the whole story. Maybe God is holding out on you. Maybe you don't have to be so literal. Maybe you can afford to become a little more enlightened and really think about this. Here's what we want you to notice. The devil's real question isn't really about the tree. It's about the character of God. In fact, every question the devil raises about God or his character or his word, and that brings us to the saddest story in the Bible. The book of Genesis says that God came to the garden in the cool of the evening only to discover that his family was hiding. Adam and Eve were afraid of God. They were experiencing fear for the first time in their lives. When they heard the sound of God approaching, their hearts started racing for the first time. Their throats grew tight for the first time. They felt sick to their stomach. And it must have seemed like they were already dying. God finds them. And with tears in his eyes, God says, Adam, where are you? What have you done? You have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat. It's piercing God's heart because he knows what this means. He's going to lose his family and we are going to die. So Adam and Eve had to go. They weren't allowed to live forever there. But I want you to notice something really important. God did not punish them without offering them hope. He gave them the very first prophecy of the Bible. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now what does a woman represent in the Bible prophecy? Jeremiah 6.2 tells us that a woman represents a church or God's people. It's a story we find in Revelation 12. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with a sun, with a moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. This is a picture of God's people waiting for Jesus to come for the first time. The woman was God's church and she was pregnant. She's waiting for the Messiah to come from one of her own descendants. And on the day that Jesus arrives, God's people have been waiting for a long time. The whole world is waiting. The whole Old Testament is a story of God's people, the woman waiting for Jesus to come. And God's people wait. As they wait, two distinct sides emerge from the race. On one hand, you've got those who are faithful to God, on the other and are waiting for the Messiah to come. But on the other hand, if you can believe it, there are people who have chosen to follow Lucifer. They actually side with the dragon. And you can see these two sides come up very clearly early in the story. In the book of Genesis, you've got the story of Cain and Abel, two brothers. One of them does exactly what God has asked. He's offered a lamb as a sacrifice because he knows that the lamb points forward 
to the Lamb of God. It's an act of faith, which is why the book of Hebrews says that Abel's offered a better sacrifice by faith. But Cain decided to do things his own way. He created a designer religion. I know that God asked for a lamb, but it doesn't really matter what I offer. I'll just offer him my fruits and veggies, because after all, that's what I do for a living. I mean, it is the thought that counts, right? And God isn't all that fussy, is he? Well, actually, no. God is not all that fussy about who he forgives. But he is fussy when it comes to the symbols that he has chosen to represent his plan of salvation. When it comes to faith and salvation, he never fools around. God's symbols always mean something very specific, and that lamb pointed forward to Jesus. So you have these two stories starting to emerge. One side casts their loyalty with the Lamb of God, and they wait for him to come. And the other side, they cast their loyalty with a dragon. And we come to the story of the Tower of Babel, a monument to human rebellion built on the plans, plains of Shinar. God's not going to get us with a flood again, they say. We'll build something tall. And what they really built was an altar to themselves. Babel means confusion, and Babylon was the city of confusion, a city full of people drunk on deception. And the city grows, and it grows, and it prospers, and it becomes the mother of all false religion, the kind of false religion that have affected the world ever since. It was Babylon that gave us astrology, the worship of planets and the worship of the sun. The Bible says that God put the sun, the moon, and the stars in the sky as a sign, as a kind of cosmic calendar. But in Babylon, they worship the sun and the moon and the stars instead of the God who actually made them. It was all about self-sufficiency. It was about building our own religion so that we could have all the trappings of spirituality without the accountability of God. It was the spirit of Cain who decided he would build his own path to heaven. It was built on the shortcut of idol worship. All the trappings of religion without a personal relationship with God. And Babylon's influence grew and it grew and again it looked like the devil was winning but God's promise was still there. Abraham. God says, Abraham, I want you to come out of Babylon. I want you to come out of this wicked place because I'm going to build an entire nation from your descendants. I'm going to place them at the crossroad of the world so that the people will see the temple and the sacrifices and they will ask, what does this lamb represent? And Elijah, an Israelite king, marries a pagan queen and he leads the whole nation to the worship of idols. He mixed paganism with a religion of God's remnant, with God's chosen people. And before you know it, God's people are worshiping idols and pledging allegiance to a false god and doing unspeakable things in the name of religion. So God sends a prophet to call them back because there is absolutely no way that he is going to allow the devil to keep the seed of the woman from coming. Listen to me carefully. This is the sin that causes the desolation of the temple. Or to use the language of the Bible, the abomination that causes desolation. Because of Israel's sin, Nebuchadnezzar came and he destroyed the temple. Let me show you why. God explained it to us through the prophet Ezekiel. So he brought me to the door of the north gate of the Lord's house. And to my dismay, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. Tammuz was a Babylonian fertility god tied to the worship of the sun. And every year in the winter, when the days were getting shorter, the Babylonians had a ritual that they would weep for Tammuz. And then they would celebrate his return when the days got longer again. And now the children of Israel were doing it too. 
in the temple, in the church. In every place where they were supposed to be telling the true story, Then he said to me, Have you seen this, son of man? Turn again, you will see a greater abomination than these. So he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and there at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men, with their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east, and they were worshiping the sun towards the east. This is God's house. You know, I'm sure that if you were to go back there and talk to the Israelites who did this, who brought pagan worship into the temple, they would say, well, we weren't doing anything wrong. They were just bringing a little tiny bit of Babylon into the temple. Because after all, how can you hope to relate to Babylon if you don't accept what they have to say? I can guarantee you that it didn't happen suddenly that just all of a sudden one day it started, that's because deception does not work that way. It always starts a little bit at a time. And you're always going to fall for it if you're not standing on the word of God. The descendants of Abraham were supposed to come out of Babylon, but they worshiped like Babylon. So God says, if that's what you want, I'm not going to force you. By all means, go back home. And the king of Babylon comes and destroys the temple. He makes it desolate, and the devil must have been laughing. And it appears that the seed of Abraham has been cut off. But then the king of Babylon suddenly has a dream. And by Daniel chapter 4, he becomes a preacher for God. Because if God says the seed of the woman is coming, then the seed of the woman is coming. Then Cyrus, the Persian, conquers Babylon, and the children of Israel go back to Jerusalem, and they rebuild the temple. They have 490 more years. There are 70 weeks for your people and your city, Daniel. And this time the devil knows he's not going to get them to worship Tammuz or the sun or the Babylonian gods. They'll never do it again. So instead, he steers them to the opposite side of the ditch. Instead of forsaking the worship of God, they become so rigid that they bury the religion of God under the mountains of tradition. They create so many man-made religions and regulations that the people actually grow to hate their religion. And again, the devil laughs. But this time, he laughs for the last time because the seed of the woman has finally come. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with an iron rod, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. Jesus is born just like God had promised. He is born as one of us. He lives like one of us, and he dies for us. He rises from the dead, and he goes back to heaven It's all in that one verse. And the cross of Christ utterly exposes the devil for what he is. Every angel in heaven could finally see what the devil is really like. Given a chance, Satan actually killed the Son of God. He had you and me crucify him. And now it's obvious what the devil is. He's a liar and he's a murderer. Listen to the words of Jesus. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. The cross was the devil's undoing. He proved himself a liar and a murderer. And at the same time, Jesus showed the world what God is really like. God is The devil may have bruised the heel of Jesus, but at the very same moment, his head was crushed. It was crushed 
by the love of God. The devil is finished because in heaven his credibility is gone. There is no excuse for what he did. And now the unfallen angels know the truth for sure. And they have more, no more use for Lucifer. The book of Revelation says that he's finished. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come. For the accuser of the brother who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. In heaven's opinion, the devil is finished. He has no audience in the courts of heaven because they know that he is a liar. Case solved. Satan utterly fails to stop Jesus. And now Jesus is completely out of his reach. He was raised from the dead. He went back to heaven. And now the devil cannot touch him. So he turns his attention towards the church. And when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persuaded the woman who gave birth to the child, to the male child. Satan can't have Jesus, so he goes for the next best thing. He goes after the thing that Jesus loves the most. That's us, the church that he gave his life to save. And historically, you already know what happened. He got the whole Roman Empire to turn against the Christian church, just like he did with Cain and Abel. He uses death and persecution to wipe out the people of God, but it didn't work. In fact, the harder he persecuted the church, the faster it grew. So the devil tried something else. If you can't beat him, you join him. All of a sudden, the Roman emperor suddenly converts to Christianity, and the persecution stops. I say, supposedly, because supposedly he converted. There is very little historical evidence that Constantine ever really converted. But the persecution stops, so that's good, right? But the bad news, it suddenly becomes very popular to be a Christian. And all kinds of people join the church because of the social benefits. So now there was a mix inside of the church of Bible-believing Christians and people who were there just trying to climb a social ladder. But they had no intention of giving up their pagan beliefs. And as a result, the Christian church became watered down and it began to lose its passion and its distinct message. And honestly, the devil got us to do some really horrible things. We took the word of God and we kept it in a foreign language so that the common people could not understand it. We made fortunes on religion. We tortured people and we burnt them at the stake because honestly, we mixed Roman-style politics with the church of Jesus Christ. And it was just one more way for the devil to try to embarrass the government of God. In fact, the words... The world still laughs at the behavior of us through the dark ages. And skeptics point to it and to our torture chambers as proof that God couldn't possibly be real. But let me tell you, in spite of our, of our behavior all through the dark ages, the devil is still losing. Right now, Christianity is still spreading and nothing will keep Jesus from coming back to his church. The devil, he loses. But unfortunately, he's so mad with ambition and pride that he still doesn't get it. He's still trying to ch steer the church off its course. He lies about God. He even gets us to blame God when bad things happen. When life gets hard, you and I are tempted to shake our fists at heaven. But let me tell you, God's not doing it. God is not the author of sin and pain and suffering. So why doesn't God just stop it? Why not just wipe out evil right now? He could. We've already had the cross. 
There is already forgiveness of sin. He could stop it right now. Why does he not? What would you want God to wipe out? Evil. But stop with you and me. You see a problem here? The Bible says that God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. So he doesn't want to wipe out sinners because sinners are human beings. People he loves. People he died for. So he waits patiently. Revelation 12, 12 says, The devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time because he's already lost. He was finished at the cross where a member of the human race, God in human flesh, took back the planet that he created. The devil, he lost. The cross defeated him. Right now he's just pretending it never happened. But believe me, it's over. The cross was real. The tomb of Jesus is empty. And there is nothing that he can do about that. The only place he can still mount a resistance is in our hearts. Even that, if you understand what's going on, is futile. It's not going to work. Not with you and not with me. Why? Because we know that Jesus died for us. We know that Jesus is coming again. And today, you know that the promise of God is real. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. It says in Revelation 21, there shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. I don't know what you're facing, but I do know that God's going to handle it. Right now, He's letting us live through this experience just once. And there is no way that we will ever choose the path of rebellion again. This is our cure. The life, this life, is the remedy. And it's just about over. You and I will still have freedom to choose in the heavenly kingdom. But after this experience, after we have touched the hot stove, nobody is going to choose to do it again. Will you bow your heads with prayer? Your Father in heaven, there is no question that this life hurts. We can see what fallen angels have done, and today we want to take our pain and leave it with you. We chose, we choose right now, Lord, to believe that you're going to make things right. We choose to believe there is no problem that we have that is not bigger than you. Teach us this morning, Lord. Open our eyes so that we can truly see and trust in you. Your Father, Please go with us and guide us. Continue to pull us to your heart. For we pray these things in the precious name of Jesus our Savior. Amen.